with me, Mephibosheth. And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant, deceive me. For thy servant said, I saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king, but my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king, yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry and any more unto the king? And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the kingdom or divide the land. Watch this. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take it all. For as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. I want to leave the thought with you tonight. Can I trust you? Ask somebody beside you. Say, can I trust you? Trust is both an emotional and a logical act. Emotionally, it is where you expose your vulnerabilities to people. But believing they will not take advantage of your openness. Logically, it is where you have assessed the probabilities of gain and loss, calculated, expected, ut- utility based on hard performance data, and concluded that the person in question will behave in a predictable manner. In practice, trust is a bit of both, both logic and emotion. I trust you because I have experienced your trustworthiness and because I have faith in human nature. Hmm. Oh, Lord. There are several different factors to trust. I want to touch it just for a moment, and then we're going to deal with the narrative for about 10 minutes, maybe less, if you give me enough amens. 20 minutes. One part of trust is predictability. You know, the truth is, sometimes it's easier to trust an enemy than it is a friend or a family member. I like this section right here. They've been through some stuff. At least with an enemy, I can detect and determine your angle. I know you don't like me. I know you want me to fail. I know that you feel heat every time I'm in your presence. I know when I walk in the room that I feel the atmosphere of because you've been running your mouth. I, I know. I kind of I kind of thrive off of that. I, I, I wish I wasn't geared this way, but I think God made me this way to be able to do what I do. I really relish in hateration. I think it's sad and funny. I don't, I, honestly, y'all, I don't have a hater's bone in my body. My wife will tell you that. I celebrate people. What I don't tolerate is someone who is not gifted in a particular area, but they're pretending to be gifted. Or they're trying to be something they were never called to be. That I can't deal with. Because you're perverting whatever gift you're attempting, and you're circumventing your calling. Because you've been called to something specifically great. But when you try to pretend to be like somebody else, not only are you unoriginal, and nobody likes unoriginality. I don't want cliches. I don't want to see the same thing. I don't want the same. There'll never be another Michael Jordan. LeBron's trying. He's awesome, but he'll never be Michael Jordan. It's not going to happen. You can get mad at him if you want to. Y'all just became Miami fans because Orlando's so sorry. So, so... I don't want you to be a counterfeit gift. I need what's in your life. You catch what I'm saying? But, but, but I, can, I can deal with the enemy because I know their angle. I know basically where they're coming from. So I can predict what they're going to do. What's difficult is when somebody that tells you they love you, someone who you have embraced in the bosom of your emotional vulnerabilities, turns around and does something uncharacteristic than what you've noticed over the 30, 40, 20, whatever years that you've known them. 
That's the struggle of trust. It messes with the equilibrium. It puts you in a place where you can't predict the future as it relates to that person. I'm preaching real good on a Wednesday night. I should have saved this for Sunday. Well, I got to preach tomorrow night somewhere, Richmond, Virginia, and then Friday night I'll be in uh, St. Louis, and I hope it's warming up out there. And then Saturday I'll be back for Spider-Man. Now, don't leave. I have a very, thank you, I have a very special announcement about Spider-Man. Nobody leave. It's on at Selvitz Park on Saturday at 1130. Amen? I changed my flight and paid a whole bunch of money so I can be there. So you better be there. Amen? So predictability. Trust means in the form of predictability the ability to predict what other people will do and what situations will occur. If we can surround ourselves with people we trust because we can predict, then we can create a safe present and an even better future. So when you are a wise person, you have the ability. Wisdom in the Hebrew, one translation literally means the ability to see the end from the beginning and to plan your life according to what you see. A wise person can predict the future. Well, that sounds strange, don't it? No, 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 no. All I have to do is be around you long enough. Study the empirical data of your behavior. Once I got you down, I can predict where you're going. Now, I'm going to talk Sunday about, uh, we're dealing with trust tonight. Sunday, I'm going to talk about intuition or the spiritual gift of discernment. I'm going to show you how to see people before they show themselves. Oh, it's going to be good. I can't wait. I'm, I'm trying not to touch it. My wife's been hearing it all week. I can't wait to preach it. But, but, but you have to be able to see where somebody's going. You have to be able to predict behavior in order to find out whether or not they fit in the sphere of influence of your future. I don't need a bunch of crazy people in my future. I had enough of them in my past and dismissed them. So if you come up to me with some stupid stuff, get ready to get deleted. Because I only want predictability in my future or me, my wife, and my babies will go by ourselves. And if they want a trip, they can stay back there too. Anyway, so, no, I'm just kidding. Then you have what's called the value exchange. This is when we exchange certain things. And there's, there's an, only a small amount of trust in this because we value what we have. So if you have sheep and I have cows, you need the milk, I need the clothes. So the trust comes in, I will get the shearing from your sheep in exchange for what you need, which is milk. So when I exchange, there's not a lot of faith in the trust exchange of goods. But where it gets a little tricky is when we get into delayed reciprocity. Reciprocity simply means to reap on what you've sown. Exchange is not, a, not, not only about intimate swapping of cows and sheep, hugs and kisses, but what makes companies and societies really work is that something is given now, but the return is paid back sometime in the future. Now, this is how you should really approach trust. True trust, and I'm going to give you the end of this when we get to the end of the story, but true trust is when you have the ability to give credit to somebody based off limited knowledge. Ooh, it's getting mighty quiet in here. Okay, let me show you what I want to build in this church. I was a three-sport athlete, really four once I got to college. I, I was in the military, and I've always wanted a church that worked like those entities. Let me explain. In and let's just take football. How many football players I have in here? Two. Well, I would talk about basketball, but, you know, we're going to talk about football. Bunch of wimps. We're going to talk about football. In football, spring practice is where you compete for your position. So everybody's competing. When I showed up with the seniors, you know, they want to knock my head off. I'm the new kid on the block. But I showed up fighting. You got to let them know I ain't no punk. I find the biggest one and hit them with my helmet. I'm not joking. Amen. You got to prove who you are and let them know you don't play. Am I talking in here? But, but I mean, I used to jump people from behind. Well, I was 150 pounds back then. They were 220. I had to get them still on them from behind. Amen. Why are y'all looking at me so funny? I fought them, some of them straight up too, with something in my hand. But anyway... You, 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 everybody's competing against everybody because you're, you're vying for your place on the team. Watch this. When you get to summer, the roster's pretty much set. Now, this is the time where you become a team. There's no longer competition. Now, there is on a certain level, but for the most part, everybody's pretty set. This is where that senior that was trying to fight you now calls you his little brother. 
That you done partied with them. You done hung out with them. Your skills with the ladies. <laughs> I'll pay for that later, I promise. And, but, but what I'm saying is now you have bonded. So now you don't think in terms of individual performance. You think in terms of team. In the military, they preach from the beginning of basic training that you are one, but they don't really mean it. What they do is they assess in the first few weeks your skill level. They assess your ability to acquiesce to your environment. I'm preaching good tonight. They, they, they do all, and then they break it down. And they teach you and show you that everything you think you know, you don't know. That you don't know what it means to be together. You don't know what it means to live this life. They break you all the way down. You tell yourself you're not going to let them do it, but they do it anyway. They got tricks. They'll keep you up for 48 hours to get in your head. They'll, they'll deprive you of food. They'll put you on a road march for six hours. Am I talking in here? You in the Marines. You had it even worse than me. Yeah, they know how to get to you. Believe me, when you ain't slept in two days, you start seeing cartoon characters in the barracks. I was in ranger training with this guy one time, and he was at the end about to graduate. I was pulling medical covers. He's about to graduate the last night, the last hour of the road march. He's going to be a ranger. He's walking in the formation. We're coming down to the last hour. All of a sudden, he goes off in the woods. <laughs> fell. Fell asleep while he was walking. Fell the course. Had to start over. So what happens then, they break you down. When they do, they teach you a very valuable lesson. My military people will tell you this. We don't fight for this country. It's getting mighty quiet in here, y'all. They don't teach you to fight for your country. Why would they? You know what they teach you to fight for? Your battle buddy. They teach you to fight for the person in the foxhole. Because they know. I'm not motivated by fighting for my country. I'm motivated by helping the person that I've been in the trenches with stay alive. The person that I see every day in my barracks. The person that I see on the battlefield. I want to keep him alive. And if I keep him alive and he keeps me alive and she keeps her alive and we keep each other alive, then in the grand scheme of things, we are fighting for our country. So what I want to build in this church is a level of trust where you can tell somebody what you're going through and they won't go tell the newspaper. You can tell somebody your struggle and you don't feel like the whole church is going to be looking at you funny. Come on, somebody. I want to build a team in this church because if we fight for each other, we can take the world. We're talking about winning souls for Jesus, but we got to build some trust in the house. Ask your neighbor again, can I trust you? And then the last one is exposed vulnerabilities. Then I got to hasten to my divine benediction. Trust. As it relates to vulnerabilities, is enabling other people to take advantage of your vulnerabilities, but expecting that they won't do it. When you can make yourself vulnerable, when you can trust that their higher self. Now, listen, you're going to get hurt in this, I'm telling you. Not in here, because I'm going to get you if you hurt somebody in here. But in life, there are going to be some people you trust, and they're going to dog you out. But don't get mad at them. It's a lesson learned. It's a piece to the puzzle. It's, see, see, ladies, don't be bitter because somebody did you wrong. Because when God sends the one that wants to do you right, you got such a defense mechanism set up that you don't let the right one in. You're looking at him through the eyes of the person that hurt you. Okay, sickle cell anemia, I did a paper on it in college, and, and sickle cell anemia is interesting because from its inception, it's a positive thing. If you have sickle cell anemia and you live in Africa, or you live in the Mediterranean, where it's more widespread than it is in America. It's a genetic, they call it a genetic disorder, but it's really not a disorder. It's a mutation to the environment. Watch this. If you live in Africa, you will never struggle with the symptoms of sickle cell. If you live in the Mediterranean, you will never suffer the symptoms of sickle cell. Because sickle cell is bo the body's reaction to malaria. It is a function in the body where the cell literally sickles to catch the malaria and stop the spread of it through your body. The problem is when you leave a warm, flat, low-level environment like Africa and you come to the United States, not here but in elevated parts where it is cold or where you're at high altitude, you have what's called episodes because this genetic uh, situation that was designed in its inception to be positive has now become negative in this environment. Watch this. You have responded to a problem like sickle cell. 
You have responded to somebody. That in that environment, your response protected you. It was good. But now God has blessed you with a better situation, but you're still acting like. So now you're having episodes with a person that's trying to be a blessing in your life, trying to help you, trying to be your lover, trying to be your husband. Can I talk to y'all? And you got this problem. Now what was once a mechanism to protect you has now become a mechanism of disorder. Grab your neighbor, say, neighbor, we got to get in order. If you want God to bless you, put your life in order. Start with your nasty house. When I want God to talk to me, I start cleaning. I'm serious. I'm serious. I start shining shoes. I'm serious. Now, I got people that cut my grass now, but I used to just go outside and start cutting the grass. When you put things in order, God is attracted to order. Go in your closet tonight, rearrange it, and watch what happens. God will start talking to you. I'm telling you, y'all looking at me funny. God is not attracted to disorder. Why do you think these hoarders you see on TV are so crazy and so loopy? The reason why is their life is out of order. So when you're out of order, God runs from disorder. But when you put your life in order, when you clean your house, when you wash your car, when you put your finances in order, when you start working on your marriage, when you start taking the time to spend time with your children. I, they know. I tell Doug sometimes, I say, listen, man, I can't do it. Why not? I said, because I haven't been around my babies in three days. They need their daddy. You know what he says? You're right, man. Because he knows. You've got to take the time with your children. Touch your neighbor and say, order. All right. I don't have time to preach this now. Y'all want the rest of this? Y'all want it? All right. Tell somebody, ask somebody, can I trust you? I'll just turn it off. Y'all ready for this? Mephibosheth. He's living in a place called Lowly Bar. Lowly bar means the place of no pasture. Now, you've got to understand Mephibosheth has been put in this almost saintly environment. He, he, he's been looked upon as this glorious figure of redemption. But, but I, I'm a little perplexed by Mephibosheth because he does some strange things, and we're going to investigate it quickly. Y'all ready for this journey? First of all, my stepfather, if y'all remember, now he adopted me, so he's legally my father, and I call him that, but just for clarity's sake, did you guys remember when he came here with my mother? I was actually preaching in Orlando. and Bishop preached here and my parents came. You saw he was in a wheelchair. He has polio. So I think at the age of five, which is the same age that Mephibosheth was dropped and became lame in his feet when the kingdom. See, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son who was the king, Saul's. That would have been his grandfather. Both of them died in battle that day. When they died together in battle, the whole house of Saul fled out of Jerusalem. When they did, Mephibosheth's nurse, he was five years old, carried him out, dropped him, and made him lame in his legs. Now, my father has had polio, of course, the entire time I've known him. And, and it's progressively, the, the disease has stopped, but the effects of it on his body, he's had like three heart attacks. He is, uh, his body can't support his organs properly. He went from being able to walk with a limp to now he's bound to a wheelchair or crutches. But let me tell you something about this man. He was a tough man. He didn't love me right when I was growing up, but we got it together when we got older. Amen? And, and sometimes you need that in your life. It made me tough. Don't test me. No. So, but, but watch this. The thing about him that I always admire, number one, he doesn't have all the use of his left arm or his right arm. He has a pole in his right arm. Now, he was born right-handed, so he had to teach himself to be left-handed. But this is what he did. With a limp. With the use of only one arm, he was an all-star baseball player in Little League. Now, how is this possible? You think they hooked him up, helped him out, but you don't know my dad. He won't let you hook him up. He wouldn't even accept the, the, the benefits from the government for being disabled. He wouldn't take one of the cards and park in the spot. He wouldn't do it. Now, his brother had it as well and was confined to a wheelchair and died earlier in life. But he never would take benefits, ever. Never. He would, he would park on the other side of the parking lot before he would acquiesce to putting one of them tags on. Now, it's kind of dumb if you think about it, but he's just like that. He said, I'm going to be normal. So watch this. So much so, I used to forget he had polio. I'd be walking around, people looking at him crazy. I'm like, what y'all fools looking at? Then I'd be like, oh, yeah, he walks funny. I just did, I got used to it. You catch what I'm saying? Because he never made it an issue. Watch this. 
He was an all-star baseball player because he could knock the mess with one hand. He would stand like this, hit the ball. Most of the time he hit a home run. When he didn't, he had a pinch. You know, he had to run to first base, limp to first base, and then he'd get a pinch runner from there. He had one of the highest batting averages in the league. That's legit. Touch and never say that's legit. He played first base with one arm. He would catch the ball, tuck it under his arm, pull the ball out, and throw it with the same arm. So my mindset toward disability is different than other people who haven't experienced it. My dad was a champion while he was disabled. He worked 25 years in a steel mill, never complained, never did less work. He worked 25 years with polio. So when I look at Mephibosheth, I see him through the eyes of my father. Am I talking in here? Mephibosheth went to a place, he was put there called Lolibar. Lolibar means the place of no pasture. So in other words, in a culture and an environment where shepherds were in abundance, he was able to go to a place where his disability was not on display. He didn't have to walk around lame. He didn't have to do activities that would have made everyone know or showed everybody that he was disabled. Y'all catching me? So I see in my mind a little bit of a character flaw because he hid himself from his struggle. Oh, it's getting quiet in here. Watch this. But you got to understand what I saw growing up. Watch this. So now Mephibosheth, he's in Lowly Bar. He's minding his own business. David says, I have to remember the oath of Jonathan that I made, that I would maintain his household, that I would bless the house of Saul. Is there anyone still alive from the house of Saul? Yes, Mephibosheth, the lame man, down in Quitterville. He said, okay. Bring him up from Lolibar. When he came, watch this. He says to David the king, he says, what do you have to do with a lame dead dog? So Mephibosheth's mindset of himself is, I'm worthless. He didn't even realize he was a king's kid. He didn't realize that the royal blood of his father and of his grandfather, the first king of Israel, was running through his veins. He saw himself in connection with his environment, not with his true self. Touch a neighbor and tell him, say, stop judging yourself based on where you are right now. You got royal blood running through your veins. You don't have to stay in lowly bar. You've got to change what you think about yourself. I'm talking. David shifts his mentality immediately. He says, no, you're a king's kid. I'm going to give you everything that your father had. Every house, every piece of land, it's all yours. Not only that, every day of your life, you're going to eat at the king's table. He shifted Mephibosheth's mindset. Let me tell you something. Whenever you come in the presence of greatness, you need to shut your mouth. Stop judging yourself based on how you think your life can go and listen to what they see. The greatest shifts in my life have been when leaders have looked and saw my future and said, no, you ain't no country boy from Clay, Alabama. I see you standing in front of millions worldwide. I see you standing on a platform in front of millions by way of television. Oh, it was prophesied. I shut my mouth and opened my ears because I needed somebody that could see what I couldn't see. Tell your neighbor, say there's somebody that can see further than you. I can see it. Watch this. He shifted his mindset. He said, you're a king. That's what he told him. Now watch this. Absalom, David's son, and I'm almost done. It don't sound like it, but I'm close. Somebody say, preach, pastor. Y'all don't mean it. All right. I know my internet audience got me. Y'all send me some tweets, internet audience. Encourage me. They come up on my iPad. Watch this. Absalom, David's son, decides and, and makes some unwise moves that he wants to become the king. So David has to flee from his own kingdom. Now, I don't have time to deal with this, but it's interesting because Bathsheba's father actually gets in league with Absalom. He was known as the wisest man in the land, but he was ticked off because of what David did to his daughter. He'd been watching his daughter since she was a small child growing up and waited for his moment to prey on her and have her husband killed. Y'all remember I touched that? All right, watch this. Y'all been listening. Amen. So he gets with Absalom. He gives him all this information and all this wisdom. Absalom makes a move against his own daddy. David, once again, with what he did with Saul, had to go on the run. 
When he goes on the run, he comes to a place in the hill country and Ziba, who was a captain of the host of Saul's house, had been attached or assigned to Mephibosheth to take care of Mephibosheth and all of his land. You got to be careful with that name. You'll be cussing for church in real. I mean, in church for real. Mephibosheth. Amen. So, so he had been assigned over this house. He had been assigned to help Mephibosheth. Watch this. He comes to David and he tells him, you have all my support. He refreshes him with supplies. He's showing that he's willing to lay his life on the line to make sure the king is taken care of. Now, that's something you can build trust on. You can build trust on somebody that's willing to risk their life to make sure you're taken care of in the most precarious position that you found yourself. He says, he asked a question, he said, where is Mephibosheth? He said, oh, king, Mephibosheth. Mm. You know, you know. remember when he thought he was just a, a, a lame dead dog? Well, you shifted his mindset. Now he's drunk with power. And you know, if you know the story, you know that Mephibosheth had a young son. Mephibosheth knew he couldn't be the king, but maybe he's setting it up for his baby boy. Maybe. He's starting to realize, I am a king's kid. And if I got Absalom fighting against David and they kill each other and I got all these people that still love my granddaddy, they still connected to the house of Saul. I got all this property, all this land. Maybe I can become the king. Ziba tells this story with such eloquence. He shares how he's plotting to take out David and Absalom and reclaim the throne for Saul's house. David believes him. Because he's risked his life to bring this news. And obviously Mephibosheth is not there. So he gives the entire inheritance of Mephibosheth to Ziba. So now the servant has just inherited Saul's kingdom. And it's been stripped from the man who was brought up from Lodabar. Y'all with me? Watch this. David eventually, his son, is killed. Of course, Absalom. David returns back to Israel. When he gets there, he meets Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth comes to him and he's, he hasn't shaved since David left. He hasn't clean, cleaned his feet since David left. He looks like a homeless person. He comes to David. David says, why didn't you come with Ziba? He says, because my Lord, Ziba tricked me. He said that he was saddling my ass or my donkey. I preached this message one time when I was a young preacher trying to be smart. When Balaam was on the donkey, but it doesn't say donkey, it says he rode the ass. And he said he struck the, the, and I preached a message, and this is how I did it. I said, don't let the devil beat your donkey. It went over pretty good, actually. But anyway, so so he he said he 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 was going to saddle the the, the donkey for me and that I would be able to ride, but he deceived me. Now, I got a problem with this because you're trying to tell me you got all these people, all this land, all this property, and there ain't nobody around there that can put you on a horse? David had the same question. So David began to question now his trust level of Mephibosheth. But Mephibosheth said, Lord, please believe me. It's not my fault. Look at me. I've been in mourning since you left. I mean, who am I? I'm nobody without you. I'm still in lowly bar. I have no inheritance without you. Why would I come against you? He says to him, well, maybe I trust you a little. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give half the kingdom to you and half the kingdom to Ziba. Now watch this. Mephibosheth says something very interesting, but I don't quite trust him until you put this in congruent order with the other texts and with different stories. He says to him, no, my Lord, let Ziba keep it all. I'm just glad that the king is back in the kingdom. Now, maybe Mephibosheth is just trying to stay alive, but there's a a, a thought process in theology that you can follow a a thematic theme through the, through the Bible, and, and all the scriptures kind of connect. Now, let's, let's follow this for two minutes, and I'm done. Well, maybe a little longer than two minutes, but y'all know what I mean. Two preaching minutes. Watch this. David had a son, Solomon, right? Solomon, the wisest king, the wisest man of the land, wrote all the wisdom books. Okay. Solomon faced a similar situation. David was the king. Solomon was the king. Solomon had two women 
They both had a child three weeks apart. One of the children, they lived in the same house. One of the children died in the night. The woman who saw took her son, switched it with the other lady's son, and pretended that the live son was hers. The mother wakes up and knows this is not my son. She switched him in the night. They go before the king, King Solomon. They say to him, they're both saying, this is my baby. He says, okay, bring out a sword. Split the child in two. Give one half to one mother and one half to the other. Of course, the real mama speaks up and says, no, king, don't do that. Give the baby to her. Because I don't want, because the other lady said, do it. No, give the baby to her. I don't want to see my boy killed. And guess what? She got her son back. Why? Because when you're faced with life and death, the truth comes out. Your haters are revealed when faced with life and death situation. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm going through some things right now. But my haters are being revealed by what I'm going through. The truth is coming out through my struggle. I know who my real friends are. Can I trust you? So following this thematic theme, we come to David. If Solomon responded this way, it's because he learned something from his father. And if we follow this line of thinking, we can forgive Mephibosheth, even though he seemed to be hiding his proclivity. Even though he seemed to be a little shifty because he didn't get on a horse. Even though it seemed like Ziba's uh, uh, direct command and his, his, his judgment of Mephibosheth was true. David saw something in Mephibosheth because he knew that if he was a rascal, if he was sorry, if he was untrustworthy, he would have took half the kingdom. But instead, he said, Lord, just like that baby that was going to be split. No, I would rather him have the whole kingdom. Just give me my king. Grab somebody and tell them, say, can I trust you? Now you have to understand David's position as I close. David didn't have to trust Mephibosheth. David didn't have to trust Ziba. Because David was the king. And the only person David needed to trust was himself. At the moment's notice, he could have had them all killed. Y'all looking at me so funny. What do you mean? When you deal with people. The first real test of trust is understanding that friends will fail you. Understanding that family members will turn their back on you. Understanding that people that you've trusted for years, if the right kind of money shows up, will turn their back on you. Understanding that people will betray your trust. But true trust has nothing to do with other people. A person who is advanced in life realizes I don't have to trust what other people do. All I have to do is trust my ability to understand that people are flawed. To understand that people will turn their back on me. But I'm big enough to deal with it. Because I know I'm a king's kid. I know I'm in rule of my own domain. And I don't have to leave my emotion in somebody else's hands. But I can empower myself I let you in my presence because I know you are flawed and you're going to make me mad but I'm big enough to handle it high five three people and tell them say neighbor you can never really hurt me because I'm secure in who I am I trust my ability if you're not there prophesy to yourself I trust my ability to handle what she'll do I prophesy and understand my ability to handle what my friend might do because I'm bigger than that. Grab three people and tell them say neighbor I'm big enough to handle it I'm like my father I'm big enough well I got to go a little further you've got to understand that you can't really trust yourself Grab somebody and tell them, say, neighbor, I know you're looking at your life through rosy red glasses, but the truth is you've got some struggles. You've lied to people. Come on, you, in fact, I told y'all, most people lie 60 times a day. You've lied to somebody. You've betrayed the trust of other people, but you've even betrayed the trust in yourself. If you're left to yourself, you'll find yourself in trouble, but I Isaiah said in Isaiah 26 and 3 uh, that would keep him in perfect peace uh, whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, Watch this. You like to stop right there. Uh, But the B portion says because he trusteth in 
thee, which means I don't trust you. I don't even trust myself. Trust in the name of the Lord. I put my trust in Jesus. That means you can do me wrong. I'm still going to sleep at night. You can mess over my life. You can mess with my stuff. You can wreck my car. You can get a ticket in my vehicle. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm going to lay down and go to sleep because I serve a God that will take that car and give me 10 to replace the wall. I serve a God that has the power to fix what you messed up. I don't have to trust you. I don't have to trust myself because I put my trust in God. Grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, I trust the Lord. He's going to bring me out. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, I put my trust in the name of Jesus and when I put my trust in it he gives me the peace that passes all understanding lean lean on your neighbor and say neighbor I'm going to sleep tonight I'm turning off the recorder in my mind telling me what they did was wrong talking about the last relationship it's running in your mind you can't sleep at night you don't have peace in your heart but forget about what they did turn it over to God and shout Lord I trust you to put peace in my mind heal my broken heart turn around the impossible and bring me into the blessing I find three people and tell them say neighbor I can trust you cause I trust God God's got my back shouty ass shouty ass shouty ass that's a good word for Wednesday night If you're ready to move beyond what people have done. See, I said this before. You need a Manasseh mindset. Manasseh's name means cause me to forget. God will bless you to such a place. You'll forget all the hell you had to go through to get it. You'll forgive everybody that came again. Listen, it's all a part of the puzzle. It's all a part of the plan. I had to go through it. So God could bring me to it. There's some lessons that you learned along the way. Woo! And now I don't trust other people. I don't even trust myself to act right. I trust God. If you're ready to reignite that place with God again, I want you to come down to this altar. I want to pray with you quickly. Come down to this altar. Lift your hands. You're tired of carrying hurt. Don't be scared. You're tired of be carrying hurt. You're tired of carrying pain. You've lost trust in everybody and everything. Let me say this to you guys. You got to stop watching all this news, man. We got a, 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 an age that's addicted to news. News is the most negative force on the planet. All of it. It's negative. They breed negativity. Bring them down here. They breed negativity. They fe it's called fear and consumption. Uh, next time you watch the news, I, and I never watch it. I might watch a little weather, but they got the weather channel. I can watch that. I watch a little sports, but they got ESPN for that. Think about this. Next time you watch the news, watch what they do. They start out talking about robberies or fires, and they just got this whole list of stuff. And then the next commercial that comes on is about fire alarms and security systems. Am I right? fear and consumption. When I put you in fear, I put you in a state of needing to get something to make you feel better. Oh, it's so quiet in here. But it's true. Fear and consumption. Let me tell you something. It's sad that somebody died in Bangladesh today. But there's nothing you can do about it but pray for their family. You go, you gonna get on a plane and go over there? So why do you, why do you want to feed yourself for that? Why do you want to get death all in your mindset? Why do, you, why do we allow this to get in our head? 
Well, I mean, honestly, I mean, if you've been here for 35 years and you're still alive, you're doing pretty good. So why are you letting death in? You need to be thinking about, you need to be feeding yourself with positive things. You are bombarded with negativity to a point that you are in the negative. Your whole life is in the negative. Do you know that it takes, I think, seven positive affirmations to make up for one negative word you hear? Now, if all you hear is negativity from the moment you wake, I don't wake up and turn on the news. I don't want to hear that mess. I listen to some preaching or something. I want to hear something positive because I've been negative for so long. I need positivity in my life. Am I talking? I don't want to hear about people dying and robbing. You attract that stuff in your life. You watch. I told you about my wife. She watched Marsha Brady, right? And Marsha Brady had the mumps. So she started walking around saying, I'm going to get the mumps. I want to get the mumps. Guess what? I know a preacher that out in L.A., he went on uh, Price is Right. He said, I'm going to get picked, and I'm going to win the show. That's what he said. That's all week long. He told us, I'm going on that show. I'm going to get picked, and I'm going to win. Guess what? Don't get mad. Listen, you've got to speak what you want, not what you've been getting. If you keep repeating it and rehearsing, you just, you're going to keep attracting the same sorry dude. Why not keep attracting all these thugs? Because that's all you know. That's all you see. Change your environment. Get on a plane. Go somewhere. Drive to another city. And come back and be here for church Sunday. You got to change your environment. Am I talking in here? I love y'all. That's why I'm preaching like this. Lift your hands on this altar. I know what it means to be betrayed. I know what it means to, to lose confidence. In fact... I'm not a very trusting person, but I can preach about it because I've learned how to trust. I've learned how to trust other people. And now my wife will tell you, I go out of my way with people. I really do. Because I expect them to mess up. And if you're a leader, look, we got to be like God. God knows. Look, look, you can do the same thing that somebody else is else does but when you look at what they did you judge them in a different way but I'm going to tell you why it's because you were not there but when you think about what you did you explain it to yourself because you say well you know I wasn't really myself that day and you know I got that phone call and I normally am not thinking like that and I was put in this situation you can reason it because you know what you were going through that got you there am I talking but you don't give the other person that kind of grace listen you don't know how many no's they had before they did the one yes. Right? I mean, you may have had a hundred no's. You ever been caught for something and they made a big deal out of it and you're like, man, they don't know I had a chance to do that like a hundred times. I only did it once. Am I talking? Y'all so deep in here tonight. Okay, I know I'm talking. So you got to start looking at life that way. People are going to hurt you. But are you big enough to deal with it? Don't go on Facebook and I'm going to get you and these bees don't know who I am. Man, come on. Class. Look, at you're talking to a man, if Doug was still here, you're talking to a man that got dogged out to the world. And I didn't even do nothing wrong. Everybody was like, see, I told you he wasn't about nothing. Only for God. Three months. <laughs> Turn it around. Every hater had to acknowledge. My phone been ringing for three months straight. Facebook meth, can you come preach for me? No. Well, maybe I will just so you can see me and apologize. Amen. No. The truth is, my wife will tell you, I don't let stuff get to me like that. I expect it. But you got to be like God. He still trusts you to be his child. He still believes in you. And you got to give people that kind of grace. And you got to live your life. Am I talking? Aren't you tired of other people controlling your emotions? Let's make a change today. Lift your hands. Some of you ain't on the altar, but you need this prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, let us put our trust in you. Let us have this ability to let go of the things we've been through. To understand that people make mistakes. Some people are just sorry. That's just how they are. But let us have grace because you can take the most sorry person, turn their life around and make them a preacher. Come on. Am I talking? You never gave up on us. Now heal somebody's heart in here tonight. They're wounded. They're crushed. Somebody hurt them. Somebody betrayed, betrayed their trust. But you got something better for them. Release them from this anxiety, this fear in their heart that every time they deal with somebody, they're going to get hurt. God, give us that 
spirit that's like you, that precious, sweet spirit. Give us that ability to attract the right type of people. Let us focus on the positives. Let us attract positive people in our life. And I speak blessing and forgiveness. Just, just start forgiving whoever it is. Just talk to it right now. You, you, I don't need to hear it. Just talk to it. I forgive. Just say their name. I forgive. I forgive my daddy. I forgive my mother. I forgive that man that hurt me. I forgive that woman that hurt me. I forget that first baby boo that hurt me. I forgive them. They owe me money. I forgive them. All right, I'm about to say something. Lift your hands. Don't spend the rest of your life chasing somebody down over some money. If you release them, God will release you. I release people from serious money that they owe me only to have God give me something for free that I couldn't pay for if I had to. Am I talking? Release it. Let it go and live your life. In fact, I decree and declare every person on this altar and in this crowd, you are released right now in Jesus' name. If you believe it, clap your hands, open up your mouth and shout release. As you go back to your seats, nobody leave. I want you to hug somebody and tell them you can trust again. Play where you were. Tell them you can trust again. Just play right where you were before. Tell them you can trust again. Good. Tell them you can trust again.